Amen. So welcome, welcome everyone on the DVD as well. And welcome everybody here. Can I get a Jesus? Jesus! Yeah, because we're here for Jesus. Yes, Ted. Amen. So we're going to start with a reading from Hebrews chapter 12. And then I'm going to invite uh, Papa Jeff, <laughs> Jeff Tarrant, to come up and share the word. Missionary to Philippines. Amen. So let's go. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to read verse 1 to 11. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 11. It's good to read the Word of God. It's good to read it with your mouth and with your voice. Amen. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. In fact, I encourage all of you, if you don't, even in your private time when you're reading the Bible, read it out loud. It's, it's, it's way better than reading it in your head. And you remember much more of the Bible and you're hearing yourself speak it. And it's very good because then you get used to hearing your own voice say the Word of God. So then when you're witnessing to somebody, it's much easier to speak to them the Word of God because you've already heard yourself speak it before. So you're not embarrassed by it. <laughs> amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> amen. Let's go Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 11. Let's read it together. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto... Jesus. Let's do it again. Looking unto... Jesus. No, a bit better. Looking unto... Jesus. You're getting better. The author and finisher of faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin." And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of Yahweh, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom Yahweh loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Who's felt chastened or disciplined by God before? Then look at, anyway, put up your hands again. Look at, find someone with their hand up and say, God loves you. And the proof is that he's disciplined you. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So if you've been being chastened or disciplined by God, it's proof of his great love for you. Amen. He's not leaving you to your own devices. Hallelujah. Verse 7. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us, as seemed best to them. But he, for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Amen. So I'm asking Jeff to come up. So Jeff is going to bring us, lead us in a teaching from the Word of God, and I'm just going to turn you on, Jeff. There you go. Wait, wait, no. There we go. You go for it. I want I want to speak to you this morning about something which has been simmering away in my spirit for some months towards the end of last year and, and the, toward the time when my wife Margaret went to be with Jesus, God did correct me in a very strong way. And 
And I know it was because he loves me and he wanted me to have a fuller revelation of what was needed for me to walk in the victory that he has for me in Christ. During the months that I've been with you in this community, uh, I've, I've experienced an amazing healing in my soul from grief and, and other things. And, and God has brought to my understanding as to what has actually been happening in me. I've been coming to see who I am in Christ. There's been a washing of the water of, of his word that's been giving me a, an understanding deep inside myself of who I am in Christ. Uh, I'd always I'd read those pamphlets about in Christ, I am this and this and this, and it named all the verses. But somehow that had never really sunk in. Somehow it had never really been part of the way I viewed myself. I would read verses like Romans 8 verse 1 that says, There is now... There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so far so good. That sounded good. Uh, but then I would read on. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Mm, is that me? No, that's not me. I so often fail to walk after the spirit. And I couldn't feel that for me there was no condemnation. I would still feel a bit condemned after reading that verse because I, I knew that I didn't always work, walk after the Spirit. And, and you know, I, I couldn't really take hold of that first wonderful promise that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So that's not how we should read that verse and we're going to come back to that in a little while. First, I, I, I want to uh, just look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and just note the number of times that this term in Christ or in him is mentioned as we go. It's so important for us to see ourselves in Christ and in him because as we see that Christ in us is our life and that our identity is in him our whole personality can be transformed to express who he is as we go on receiving his life and his grace uh, in ministry school on uh, Thursday it was Nick was talking about a conference that he went to where the uh, presenter had been talking about the difference between guilt and shame. And he'd pointed out that guilt was because we feel guilty because we know we've done wrong. But shame is because of how we see ourselves. We feel ashamed because of who we are, who we see ourselves to be. And, and for many of us, um, well for me anyway, I better just talk about myself. Um, I knew that, that God forgave my sins, that as I confessed my sin, he was faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And then when I'd do something else silly or muck up in some way, I, I would just feel ashamed and just feel I wasn't really measuring up to what... Um, God wanted me to, to, be, to, to be and the way he wanted me to live. I'd feel shame because of not really seeing that he'd given me a whole new identity and that identity is in Christ. So let's listen as we go through Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus the faithful in Christ Jesus. So, let's say together, I am a saint because I am in Christ Jesus. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord 
Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. In Christ. Every spiritual blessing is already ours. Say it together. In Christ. We are in Christ. Now, even while we're mucking up, even while we're doing things we know we shouldn't do, God wants us to see our identity is in Christ. Just as, verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So God chose us to be holy and without blame before him in Christ right now. It's not while we're doing the right things. We have a new identity. It's in him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, having predestined us, and this is just amazing. Verse 5 we're up to now. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So what's God's eternal purpose? What's he predestined us to be? He's predestined us uh, to be placed as mature sons who fully reveal our Father. To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted. How are we accepted? By what we do, by always doing, we're accepted in. Thank you, Margaret. In the beloved. Let's say we are accepted in the beloved. We are accepted in the beloved. Even while we are growing to maturity. Even while we are growing to maturity. Hallelujah. Even while we're still making mistakes, even while we're growing, a big part of us being able to grow and able to go on is to see that God has given us a wonderful new identity in Christ, in the Beloved. Hallelujah. Um, so verse 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, in himself. Grace gives us God's wisdom to make known and makes known to us his will, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In verse 11, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So let's say in Christ we have an inheritance. In Christ we have an inheritance. Amen. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Then in him you also... Trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So let's say after first trusting in Christ, I was sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The first trusting in Christ, I was sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is the, I was sealed actually in him. I was sealed to be in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. And usually we know that comes after our baptism. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. 
verse 14, who, the Holy Spirit it's talking about here, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So what's the purchased possession? It's us, isn't it? It's our body. Your body is the purchased possession of Jesus. The scripture says you are not your own. You are brought with a price to glorify God in your body, which is God's. So we are his purchased possession. So what's it talking about here when it says the redemption of the purchased possession? It's talking about our body becoming the place where Jesus is fully manifested. So when Jesus comes to live in us, um, his purpose for doing that is that we should be redeemed, spirit, soul and body. We're already redeemed in our spirit because when we're born again, our spirit is joined with his spirit. Those that are, uh, those that are Christ are one spirit with him. Jesus has come to live within us, but he wants to redeem the whole of us so that we come an expression of who he is. So we are God's purchased possession. It is to the praise of his glory to redeem us from all sin until we are fully revealed as his mature sons, male and female. The Holy Spirit working in us is the guarantee of our inheritance while we are still on the way to receiving his promise. Christ is our inheritance and all he inherits is ours in him. Isn't that amazing? Christ is our inheritance. He's got an inheritance in us to fully reveal his glory in us. Okay? His inheritance in us is that his glory is fully revealed in us. We must remember when reading this wonderful chapter of Ephesians that Paul is talking to people who have the foundations of the faith well laid in their lives. They've come to Jesus with real repentance from sin and of dead works. They've put their faith in Jesus. They've been baptised and they've received, they've been sealed then with that Holy Spirit of promise. When, we've, when we just receive Jesus, yes, it is by the Holy Spirit and we do have, the, and, and we do have his Spirit, but there's, a, there's a, a further sealing that comes um, after our baptism, we'll find through the book of Acts that nearly always there was a laying on of hands after baptism to receive the Holy Spirit. Um, so he's talking to people who have these foundations well laid in them. And I want to, to say to you this morning that I believe it's the foundation of baptism that really enables us to see our new identity in Christ. We can know that Jesus has come to live in us, but how do we actually come to see that we are in him? And I believe that understanding what God has done for us in our baptism is a big part of this. It is actually the foundation of baptism that positions us to receive our new identity in Christ. So when we baptize what happens we're identifying with Jesus in his death, his burial and in his resurrection for us. Romans chapter 6 and we're fairly familiar with these scriptures or most of you will be likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin but alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? So the old man, the old nature that sins against God was baptised into the death of Jesus. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father even so 
we should walk in newness of life. So it's a whole new life. Our, our old self has been crucified with Christ, buried with him, now we're raised and our life is in Christ. Galatians 3.27 says, For as many of you as were baptised into Christ have put on Christ. You've been baptised into Christ. You are in him. Then sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So baptism provides a firm foundation for faith to take hold of our new identity in Christ. So whether I feel like it or not, I am raised with Christ to walk in a new life, which is his life. I am in Christ. Christ is my new identity. So if you've been baptised, say with me, I am in Christ. I am in Christ. Christ is my new identity. Christ is my new identity. Hallelujah. So when I was born again, I knew that Christ lived in me by the Holy Spirit. But I struggled for a long, long time to see myself in Christ, perhaps not fully realising the, what, what God had done in the foundation of my baptism to really say, now hang on, it's no longer I that lives, it's Christ that lives in me and my life is in him. So when we really understand those things, we can read Romans 8 verse 1 in quite a different way. Therefore, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus that is me I am in Christ Jesus and then when it says who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit instead of understanding it in the wrong way that I did we can know that as a new creation in Christ I always walk according to the spirit I always please God who I am never sins that's a, that's a huge thing, isn't it? You say, but I do sin. Yes, but it's not I, it's the sin that dwells in me that Paul says, Paul, as Paul would say. It's the old, I, I only acting out of my old man or my old nature that's been crucified with Christ, can I sin? The new life of Christ within me cannot sin. It cannot walk other than in the Spirit. So I'm seeing my real life is not with that old man who does sin, who does go off and do things that aren't led by the Spirit, but I'm seeing my life as being in Christ, in Him. He is my life. Yes, the old man can sin, but as far as God is concerned, that sinful nature is dead, crucified and buried with Christ. Do you believe that? That's happened in your baptism, brethren. It happened in my baptism, but it hadn't really become a reality in my experience, in my consciousness. But God's making it a reality, and that's having a wonderful effect on my life. It's bringing healing, it's bringing change, it's bringing deliverance, it's bringing salvation in a way that I hadn't experienced for so long. Amen. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now by receiving his grace, receiving his grace, that which is already done on the cross can be made real and experienced through faith. It's seeing myself in Christ that's making a huge difference in my life. And I hadn't even realised that what, what was happening in this loving community where I'm in daily discipleship, hearing the word of God every day through not only through the person speaking up front, but through my brothers and sisters who are speaking to me the word of God. It's washing me. It's, it's giving me an understanding of my identity that's sunk deep, sinking, sinking deep down into my spirit that, to know that I'm actually in Christ. That's my identity. Hallelujah. So there's some other scriptures in which we can see this, that everything God gives us, his gift of eternal life is given to us in Christ so Romans 6 23 says for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. So say, I have received God's gift in Christ. Let's say it together. I have received God's gift in Christ. We know, 1 John 5.20, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So we are in his Son, brethren, Jesus Christ. God doesn't see our muck-ups and our failures. That only comes out of the old man, the old nature. He sees our new life in Christ. He sees us in his Son. That doesn't mean we don't have to repent of sin. Yes, we do, because God wants every part of us to be so filled with Christ that we walk as he walked, that we don't sin. But while we're on the way, he sees us in Christ. Yes. Hallelujah. Therefore, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I want us to say it. Therefore, because I am in Christ, I am a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Can you do that? Because I am in Christ, I am a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. You know, it was God's idea to place us in Christ. It wasn't our own idea. Uh, but, of, but of God, we are in Christ. Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1.27, Paul says to them, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things to put to shame the things which are mighty, the things which are base of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen, the things that are not to bring to nothing, the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Brethren, God has chosen us to put to shame the wisdom of man, that the things that are, that are exalted by man are foolish toward him, but the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man. We begin in Christ, you know, as babies, and we need to grow up. Listen to how Paul talks to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3.1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. What does it mean to be carnal? and babes in Christ. It means that Christ is living in them, but they're not yet living in Christ, are they? They're still acting out of their own reasoning, their own understanding. They're still thinking, I wonder if I can do good enough to please God, and they're perhaps doing all the rules and trying their best to please God, but, but that always fails. We cannot please God out of our own ability, out of our own reasoning, out of our own efforts. We can only please God when we start to see that he's placed us in Christ and that everything comes out of Christ by faith. The life that I live in my flesh, Paul said, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He said, I strive more abundantly you, than you all, but not I, but the grace of God working in me. What's the grace of God? It's the life of Christ. It's Christ living in and through him because God has placed him in Christ. So we begin in Christ as babies. And Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And in that verse there it says, by grace you have been saved, but it's actually that present continuous tense there again, by grace you are being saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, even the faith's not of yourselves, it's God's gift to you in Christ. It's actually the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
For when, for if, Romans 5.10, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, so we've been reconciled by receiving Jesus' death on, in our place, but now having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. What's that talking about? It's talking about the redemption of the purchased possession. It's being saved from every trace of sin until it's truly Christ being expressed in our mortal bodies. That's what God's word says is his intention for us. And we can sometimes read that and think, oh, that sounds good, but it couldn't really happen. Yes, it can really happen because God's word says so. And I believe with all my heart that Jesus is coming for a church in which that has really happened. It will be a glorious church without spot or blemish or any such thing. So as we have... So notice there the first verse there, Ephesians 2.8 says that by grace we are being saved. Romans 5.9 says... 5.10 says we are being saved by his life. So I think that's probably the best biblical definition of grace that we have. Grace is the life of Christ saving us. Saving us until he is fully expressed, fully formed. Our minds been renewed, been transformed by the renewing of our mind. Uh, we've been saved from sin until it's Christ living in this mortal body. But it's not in us as individuals, it's together. There's a real togetherness about all these verses if we look at the context of them, which we haven't got time to do to now. He's talking about, he's talking to a church when he's even saying, Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's not talking to individuals, he's talking to the whole church at, uh, at um, Colossae, isn't it? Yeah, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in themselves, in their own ability. No, in Christ. He's the one that's perfect. It's his life in us that will enable us to be presented perfect in Christ. Galatians 5.25 says if we live in the Spirit, so Christ is in us by the Spirit, he says then let us walk in the Spirit. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Jesus Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. What's a carnal Christian, a babe in Christ? One who's still having confidence in the flesh. One who's still seeing themselves separate from Jesus. Not really seeing that they've been placed in Christ. You know, every good thing is in you, in Christ. Yeah. Hallelujah. Colossians 1.27 uh, Sorry, we'll go to Philemon one uh, six. Paul prayed for Philemon. He said that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So did you know every good thing is in you in Christ Jesus? Let's say that together. Every good thing is in us in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Do we confess that? Do we actually confess the good things that are in us in Christ Jesus? Or are we talking about the problems of who we are out about our old man, our old identity that's been buried. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> okay, we have a new identity, we have a new life. Are we talking about that? Are we talking about every good thing that's in us in Christ? Colossians 2.10 actually says you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So every good thing is in us in Christ now. And our hope is that his life will grow in us so that he's fully revealed in us. That's God's purpose, the the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're called through the gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not just born again to go to heaven. We're born again to grow up as sons and to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ in reality. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Colossians 1.30 says, But of him you are in Christ Jesus. It was God's idea. 1 Corinthians, sorry, 1.30. Of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, and I've put in brackets and everything else that we need because we are complete in him. So we need to be confessing. We need to be believing that Jesus, you're my righteousness. It's not what I, how, I, how I might have done when I acted out of my old man or my carnal reasoning. That's not who I am. Jesus is my righteousness. I'm complete in him. He is my sanctification. He is my redemption. Let's start confessing every good thing that's in us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 1.31 it says, Therefore as it is written, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So all we really have to glory about is who we are. In Christ, we glory in the Lord. We glory in Jesus, who is our life. Amen. Hallelujah. Self-reliance. Uh, look, there's a wonderful verse in Habakkuk that sort of sums all this up. It says, perhaps Habakkuk verse two, uh, sorry, chapter two and verse four. Behold the proud; his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Or by keeping faith. Remember Paul says, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Because through that faith, grace is released. The life of Christ is released to save us in every situation we're in. So if you're in a difficult situation, don't reason out what you should, should do or shouldn't do. Ask for grace. Receive it through faith. Find the life of Christ working in you to save you, to give you the wisdom of God perhaps to find those lost keys or, or whatever it is, even in, even in the simple things of life and lost <laughs> bags. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Even the simple little things of life, he can give you grace to receive his answer in. Mm. So behold, it, the, the opposite to walking in, in, in faith is to be proud and upright, in, uh, 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 to be proud. And it says his soul is not upright in him. Pride's the opposite to depending on God. Walking in dependence on ourselves is the opposite to walking in dependence on Jesus and trusting him to receive his life as grace to save us. Philipp, uh, uh, let this mind, oh this is Philippians, let this mind 2 and verse 5 be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. And we go on to read that he humbled himself, he became obedient to death. He had a real humility that enabled him to become obedient to God, but die on the cross for us. So knowing that God has placed us in Christ and that every good thing is in us in Christ brings faith and grace. For us to actually grow up to be fully found in him. Remember Paul says what his aim was. Paul very well knew he was in Christ. But he knew that the work of actually fully forming Christ in him was not yet complete. He said so my goal is to be found in him. He didn't mean in, in he knew that he was actually placed in Christ. But he knew that there was still some of the old Paul left there that God had to get rid of. So that all of his life was just an expression of who Jesus was and who Jesus is. <coughs> our goal is to be found in him, not having our own righteousness, which is from the law. What's that mean? We're trying to do things out of our own ability, out of our own reason, out of our own strength to please God. That's not the sort of righteousness that even our good works we have to repent of often. Because those good works are just works of self-righteousness. They're things that we would want to do that makes us feel better. If God sees that motive there, he'll ask us to repent of things that even look like good works and say, hang on, that's not what I asked you to do. I asked you to do this. That's the work that will lead you into the good works that I've prepared for you from before the foundation of the world. Uh, 
So <coughs> Paul could say, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but it's Christ that lives in me. So what are the signs of a lifestyle of living in him or abiding in him or of living in Christ? The first one is receiving grace to keep God's word. 1 John 2.5 says, But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. And by this we know that we are in him. We'll actually keep his word by grace, not by our own effort, but by the work of the Holy Spirit bringing the life of Christ as grace to save us. John, uh, who abides in him does not sin. 1 John 3, 6. 1 John 3, 24. But he who keeps the, his commandment abides in him and he in, in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he gives us. The Holy Spirit gives a witness that Christ is in us and that we are in him. The second sign of a lifestyle of living in Christ is receiving grace to confess that Jesus as the Son of God. 1 John 4.15 says, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So grace and living in Christ will give us a constant confession of who Jesus is. After all, he's our life, isn't, isn't he? Yes. All that we have is in him. So we're constantly going to be confessing Jesus. We're going to be talking about him. We're going to be understanding what it is for him to be the Christ and the Son of God. Uh, and another, the next the, the final thing, no, it's not the final. Receiving grace to be confident in prayer is another expression of us abiding in Christ. It says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Hallelujah. And finally, receiving grace to walk as he walks. First John 2, 6 says, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Yeah. Uh, and, and grace also perfects us in love and brings us boldness before God. First John 4.17 says, The love has been perfected among us in this, that we have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. That's God's purpose for us. We sometimes just read these things as if they were unreal or not really what God wanted. That is his purpose for us. He can bring us there. So just to go through the signs again of, of, of understanding that as we understand that our life is in Christ and begin to abide in him by faith, then these things will begin to appear in our life. We'll receive grace to keep the word of God. We'll receive grace to confess Jesus as the Son of God. We'll receive grace to be confident in prayer. We'll receive grace to walk as he walked. And we'll find that through his grace, love is perfected that gives us boldness before God. Amen. So in Christ we are a new creation being saved by his life as we are conformed to his image. God bless you. <laughs>